Welcome to First English Lutheran Church. We are so excited to have you worship with us today. A reminder that you can uh, keep up to date with everything happening both in our church and in our community through our email messenger and also through our newsletter that goes out in the mail each month. So keep an eye out for both of those uh, to stay up to date about what's happening both in our church and just around in the community. I'll invite you now to take a deep breath Center your heart and your mind as we prepare for worship. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus that bears our cross, the spirit of one who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God and humanity, confess our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice by overwhelmed by the fear of violence and suffering, we are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown. Forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we have turned away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right pathway. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice strength stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making new ways for us. And in Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God's people on earth. Amen. 
us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Let lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Let me sing for my beloved, my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, and he planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewn out of a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but yet it yield wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do in my vineyard that I have not yet done? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you. What I do in my vineyard, I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down the wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I also command the clouds, that they have no um, rain, no rain upon it. For the vine of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant plantings. He expected justice, but he saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 80. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadows, and the towering cedar hills by its boughs. You stretch out its tendrils to the sea and the branches to the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by are plucked off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it. The beast of the fields has grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts. Look down from the heavens. Behold and tend his vine. Preserve what your right hand hand has planted. Our second reading comes from Philippians, the third chapter. Paul writes, If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all these things, and I have regarded them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but the one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may maintain the resurrection from the dead. Now, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider what I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and 
beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to Jesus, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Now, perhaps going about your life, you've probably heard of the, what's called the no true Scotsman fallacy, in which case no true Scotsman would do such and such a thing. It's a form of argumentation that is, of course, loaded in a way of saying there really is no such thing as a true Scotsman. And often maybe you've heard this applied to Christians as well. No true Christian, you might hear someone say, would vote for that politician. No true Christian would ever be involved in those kinds of acts. No true Christian would ever have that much wealth. Whatever it may be, we get caught in the similar type of thinking around being a Christian to the point of where we might wonder, well, what is a true Christian? How do I know when I've seen one? Certainly, somebody's life and all of their experiences can't be simply reduced down to who they vote for, how much wealth they have, whatever it might be. They are more complex, they are more human than those things, than the deeds that make up their life. In our scripture for today, Jesus comes with a parable. And the parable, as you heard, ruffled some feathers with the religious leaders of the day. And there's a sense of where on, underneath the, the surface of the parable, Jesus is giving the whole history of Israel. That history of killing the prophets. And so there is a question of identity here in this parable that Jesus is giving. What does it mean to be a Jew? Who is a true, devoted servant of God? There is the, the assertion here about producing fruit. Of course, the whole parable is about these tenants, or yes, these tenants who, who won't give the fruit to the owner of the vineyard. They don't produce. And we also heard a similar parable, similar story, or, or however you might put it, in Isaiah, about a vineyard that produces wild grapes instead of good grapes. And that, and that vineyard is utterly destroyed. A desolate place it becomes. And it too is said to represent Israel and Judah. And so we see here Jesus is putting together this parable and this story, and he's drawing out this purpose of identity. Who are the people of God? How do we know them? Is producing fruits 
all that we have to look to? These are the questions we have today. Because, but there's a distinct difference between Jesus' parable and what we have in Isaiah. In Isaiah, you may have noticed that the, the, the story of the vineyard ends with it being a desolate ruin. And it is said to represent Israel and Judah. However, in Jesus' parable, there is a switch. The tenants who are no longer worthy of keeping the vineyard and gathering the fruits to give to the uh, owner are removed. And Jesus says, therefore, those who have been given the kingdom of God, it will be removed from them and given to those who produce fruits. Now, there's a way of reading that where we're getting caught up again in the no true Scotsman fallacy. Who is the Christian that produces fruits? Nothing but fruit. and never fails. Certainly I've never seen them. Certainly I'm not one of them. Not throughout all my life. And certainly my future, though I have intentions about it, always remains a little bit uncertain. So what does it mean, then, to say producing fruits? That's one way to read it. But Christ gives us another way to read it. And that is in the manner of promise. The kingdom of God will be given to those who will produce fruits. Will. Not by their own doing, but by the power of the Spirit that dwells in them because of God's love poured out in the world in Christ Jesus. Death and resurrection. You'll notice that the, uh, the son who is sent into the vineyard is pulled out of the vineyard and killed outside, similarly to how Jesus will be taken outside of Jerusalem and murdered, but will be raised again. Hence why he brings in this citation of the cornerstone, the cornerstone that has been rejected will now become the cornerstone, the one that is holding the walls together, that holds the whole building together, in fact. And so we see here in Jesus' parable this promise of death and resurrection. So when he gets down to the, where the kingdom of God will be placed into whom's hands and what they will do, that promise follows the promise of resurrection. It is to say that we are all Christians who confess Christ. We are all Christians who believe. We may not always act like it. We may not always live like it. But it is God who is working in us. It is God who is faithful. It is God who will give us the kingdom and produce the fruits of the kingdom. It is to say that the world is changing. The world is being transformed by the presence of God's people because of God. Because of what has been done in Christ Jesus. So may you be a true Christian in that you believe in Christ and that you are filled with the Spirit and so moved to love the world as God has loved the world. 
that you are a true Christian in that your life is being changed by the grace of God continuously coming to you and moving through you out back into the world. That you are a true Christian because of the grace that God gives to all. So go and be a Christian by the power of the Spirit. May it be so in each of our lives. Amen. And now, trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all in need. God of all grace, you are the source of life and joy. Strengthen the resolve of your church throughout the world, that together we press on toward the goal of your heavenly call in Jesus Christ. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all creation, you plant and nourish the earth as your own precious vineyard. Bless fields and orchards and the hands of those who labor in them, that your people are fed with an abundant harvest of good fruit. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all the earth, you desire peace and justice between nations and peoples. Guide leaders of nations, states, and cities that they faithfully govern your people with wisdom, integrity, and compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all compassion, in Christ you lovingly poured yourself out like wine for your people. Have mercy on all who mourn, who struggle with their mental health, who cry out for justice, who hunger, and all in any need this day. God of grace, Hear our prayer. God of all steadfastness, you set Christ as the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Build up this congregation as living stones, that it stands in the community as a witness to your enduring faithfulness and love. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all hope, the saints who came before us lived and died with their hearts fixed on you. 
We give you thanks for their faithful witness, and we wait with hope for the great day when we join their voices in praise. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, our bread of life, our table, and our food, you create a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and you fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world in the night in which he was betrayed. Our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and in want. And by this bread and cup, make us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. abundant table. You have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now receive the blessing. God who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, 
guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.